Okay, so last time we stopped. Where did we stop? Okay, so for the assignment, for example, there is a question um, talking about the Keck telescope in Hawaii. And you see that the mirror is made of several segmented mirrors, right? Like hexagons that are connected to each other and each one of them can move independently. So there is a question like this. You see, this is huge. And there was also a question um, about this one. It's a 30 meter Hawaii. It was supposed to be the largest telescope on Earth. And, uh, and there is an issue with uh, people living over there, Octocton, because their land is uh, uh, holy land, right? So there was like still a fight going on. So it's not, uh, I don't even think they started to build it, right? And they are also building a new telescope in Chile, right? And this, these telescopes are already there. So anyway, for the assignment, you want to use the slides. Okay, so we talk about space telescope. Okay, there is also a question about this infrared telescope that is retired. Okay, it's not uh, it's not uh, operating anymore, but the name of Sophia. So it was for infrared. There is a question about X-ray telescopes, and you see the very old one. The, 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 the oldest one was named after Chandrasekhar, so also a question about that. Chandrasekhar was from, was uh, this Indian who, who, who did a lot of work on, uh, on stars, evolution of stars, and uh, using quantum, quantum physics and general relativity. So there was one question about that. Uh, the Hubble telescopes, okay, space telescope. Okay, and then we come here, which is the James Webb Telescope. It was launched in uh, December 2021, and, but they started to work on it in 1996. So it's a very, very advanced technology. It took a very, very long time to develop it. And it was the first time, so it was, uh, so he used, they used the rocket here, launched from Guyana, so you have two, to Guyana, one of the Guyana is French, so it's called French Guyana, and and they have a special pad for to to launch those rockets here. They are European. The name of the rockets are Ariane, which is a French name. So anyway, it's um it's launched from Kourou, that's a place in French Guyana, and and you see the telescope here was folded like a chrysalid. Okay, so it was the first time they did that, and then it was launched into space, and it's in a very, very stable orbit, and it's able to detect infrared, because I told you, I think there was also a question about that, but when light comes really, from really, really, really far away, from the first, first galaxies, just after the Big Bang, the light, even the optical light, the visible light, that we collect from those galaxies, because the universe is stretching out, those light will be, the light coming from those galaxies will be stretched out. So from visible, you go to infrared. So this telescope will be able to see, or is able to see those very, very ancient galaxies. And that was not a, a possible with a um, Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so I have a video, it's a great video, but it's a long video. So I don't think, uh, I'm gonna skip through, okay? So it comes from a channel on YouTube, it's a very famous channel, and uh, it's called Smarter Every Day. So the guy is very famous, but he has a dad, and the dad worked on, on, on the James Webb Telescope on one, one of the components. So you, you involve a lot of engineers in building a telescope and each each one or each team focus on one thing. So I think his dad was involved in building the, the solar panel, right? To get energy from the sun. So I'm not going this to is my dad. show you. And you can see it on uh, YouTube. Um, I'm just gonna skip.
but it gives you an idea of, of the technology involved. You see, they, they need to have, it's not because of COVID, right? You just need to have a special suit, the kind of suit you want to wear when you are working in a factory that make uh, silicon waffles, for example, and then they make the chips for computers or phones. So the, you have to protect, I mean, you don't want any dust. You, do, you don't want to uh, emit, I mean, produce any dust. And he's about to finish this major job you've been working on, which is the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Why, of course. Uh, I don't know why you cannot hear the sound. I never know why you cannot hear the sound. What's wrong with the sound? HDMI, I did HDMI. Oh, sun shield for the James Webb Space. Special, what does it mean, special sound? Oh, I know. Okay. I'm going to change. That's the not HDMI. No sound, no HDMI. This is not a HDMI. There was another HDMI, what was it? HDMI. This is my dad, and he's about to finish this major job you've been working on, which is the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Sun shield for the James Webb Space Telescope. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome, Welcome back to Smarter, Smarter Every Day. The James, James Webb, Webb Space, Space Telescope, Telescope is about is to launch, launch. and this and is this a is really big deal that people from all over the science community have been waiting on for years. By the time you watch already launched, launched or, may or may have been in operation, operation for decades. decades. It doesn't, it doesn't really, really matter, matter because today, today we are going, going to talk to a very special person and we're going to learn a lot about, about the James Webb Space Telescope. Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope is too big to fit into any rocket payload fairing, so in order to get it to space, it has to be folded up and launched in this more compact configuration. After launch, it's designed to unfold like origami in what I see as a series of precisely choreographed engineering miracles. Not only do you have to make sure all this stuff works, but it has to happen after the incredibly violent vibration Vibration environment of a rocket launch. Projects, Projects like the James, like the James, James Webb Space, Space Telescope, or the JWST as it's known, known takes so long to make and are in operation, operation for so long, so it's incredible. incredible. You just saw my dad, and, and I would be fascinated, fascinated with the James, James Webb Space, Space Telescope, Telescope, whether or not dad worked on it or not, but the fact that he did makes it pretty darn special for me. And in an upcoming video, we're going to explore exactly what dad did on the sun shield because it's really cool and there's a lot to learn there. But first, I want to learn about what the James Webb Space Telescope is, how it works. So I was wrong, okay? Don't work on the solar panel, but a, a solar solar shield, so to to protect the telescope from from the sun sun ray, right from from the heat. So sorry for all that. the important things, and we're going to do that by talking to a very, very special, special individual. individual. A number of years ago, back in 2017, I had an incredible, incredible honor. honor. I was invited I was to Goddard Space, Space Flight Center, Center, and I had and the I opportunity to speak with an incredibly important person working on the project, project. Dr. Dr. John Mather. Mather. Before we start this conversation, I want to explain its importance to you. If you could pick any human in all of history to explain the James Webb Space Telescope to you, you would pick Dr. John Mather. First of all, he's an astrophysicist and a cosmologist, and he actually won the 
won the Nobel Prize for Physics along with George Smoot for his work on the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite. What I'm trying to say is he understands the night sky like no other. Well, astronomers have been looking for the center of the expanding universe for a long time, and there is no sign on. Imagine an infinite universe that is expanding into itself infinitely, uh, without a boundary, without a center, without an edge. The second reason you want to listen to Dr. Mather talk about this is because he is the senior project scientist over the James Webb Space Telescope. And what that means is he represents the interest of science to the project managers over the project. And given the fact that he knows all this stuff and the whole project is about science, you can imagine how important that means his perspective is. Not only are we speaking to a brilliant mind who knows many, many things, he's also very kind. For example, when I'm doing the interview, which isn't the best execution of an interview I've ever done, I'm trying to film him in the side room of a little conference center. My camera kept overheating, and he was very patient with me, as I hope he will be too. It's just really, really simple. Like, we're talking about the most complex thing that humans have ever built in a very simple way, and I'll interrupt uh, throughout a little interview here, and we'll have some more simple drawing conversations. It'll be fun. So, let's do it. Let's go talk to one of the many brilliant minds working on the computer. Let's go ahead and be comfortable. So, um, I, I've heard I'm the original senior project scientist. Okay. I've had a huge team project. Okay. So, it's more like a solar energy concentrator. And it has this huge hexagonal mirror made out of 18 smaller hexagons to collect the starlight or the galaxy light from over here. So you see, we already talked about that, right? So the ray from from the galaxy, for example, come parallel to each other. They're going to be reflected here and reflected again, and and then it's going to be processed. Bounces off of that, bounces off a little convex mirror up here and back down, down, down into this, this uh, black uh, area, which is the beginning of the instrument pattern. Is, is that called is a cascade? These, These two parts, two parts, make, it parts make it a cascade. There's mm -hmm. a third big mirror that you can't see that makes it called a three mirror and a stick back. Say that one more time. Three mirror and a stick back. I'll have to go look at that. It means that it bears a good image over a much larger piece of sky. Got it. So we really care about that because we want a really good image and we have a big camera. Okay, so I did have to look. That up. Three, three mirror, mirror and a, no, no, and a stick mat. Mat. Three mirror three and a stick mat. Mat. Basically, it means that light gets bounced off of mirrors three times before it gets to the instruments or sensors that are taking the picture. Each of those mirror bounces is for a very specific reason. The big mirror essentially is like a big bucket. It collects all the light as it's traveling through space, and then they focus that down. They want it as big of a mirror as possible because that means they can get more light, a bigger bucket. So all this light reflects off that big concave mirror and is focused down onto the little secondary mirror in front of Think about it. That is so much more light hitting that little mirror than if the little mirror was just looking out into space by itself. All that light then goes deep into the telescope and is bounced off of one more mirror, and then it goes to what's called the fine steering mirror. This mirror compensates for the movement of the spacecraft and kind of works like image stabilization. And back here in the back of all these optics, that's where all the astigmatism is taken out of the image. Three mirror and astigmat, but there's a fourth mirror in there to like work like image stabilization. Got it. The hardest thing for us to build was this giant mirror because it's made out of. 18 pieces, pieces. Uh, and, and they all have to be adjusted, adjusted to, the, to the right place right after we get there in the space. space. So each of them is made out of beryllium, which is very light and very stiff, and it holds its shape when it's cold. Uh, that was our hardest thing to learn how to make them ultra light, because each of these hexagons is something you'd be able to lift with your hands if we'd allow you to do it. Uh, so they're really thin material and really, really accurate. Behind the telescope, the mirrors, it is the instrument that we touch as the cameras and spectrometers, and we had to invent some things for that too. Uh, we needed much better detectors. Uh, the detectors are made of two flavors, uh, one called mercury cadmium telluride, and one is called arsenic gold silicon. And the combination of those two things give us the sensitivity to the whole wavelength Range that we and they didn't exist before? Well, well they existed, but they weren't good enough. Good enough. Uh, they weren't they sensitive, sensitive enough and they weren't big enough. enough. Gotcha. So you really had to push on that. Uh, other things that are obviously difficult, difficult is how you can make this, this big thing. thing. So what I'm pointing at here is the sun shield. Sun shield. So it's made, so it's made out of five, five layers of thin plastic coated aluminum. Capton? Capton. So the sunshine comes up from this side. Uh, and it's all, all reflected away. So only a little tiny bit of heat gets through yeah, this side. So we want the telescope to be cold, cold and also and very stable. Basically, Basically, the telescope will be flown in such a way that the sun's rays are always hitting the bottom or the instrument side of the sun shield and leaving the mirrors in the shadow. Just like on Earth, when we only see the stars when our side of the planet isn't facing the sun, which we call nighttime, well, with this big sun shield, the web can create its own continual night for the telescope. One side of the telescope is always in the dark and the other side is seeing light, which is a really interesting way to do this 
because typically you have to do the thermal management systems to keep everything at the right temperature. But when you keep the optics cold, you don't have to worry about temperature fluctuations. So you can set it the way it needs to be and you can let it do its thing. This is a fascinating engineering problem and we'll talk about this more in a future episode. Things that are more ordinary, we still have to figure out on the warm side of the the sun shield is uh, the spacecraft box, box that uh, contains uh, uh, all the spacecraft electronics, the power supplies, the rocket engines, the fuel tanks, the transmitters and receivers, and receivers, and receivers, and receivers, everything that it takes to, uh, to run the observatory is on this side. Is, is that how is you also how position the spacecraft? Space where, like, where are the reaction wheels, for yes, example? Yeah. We have reaction wheels in here that are used to point the spacecraft in the right direction. Um, uh, and we have rocket jets, jets, which are used to, to for two things. One is to maintain the orbit, orbit uh, because it's an unstable orbit. orbit. And the other is, once in a while, to unload the reaction wheels, because the reaction wheels uh, collect, collect angular momentum. momentum. And where do you get the angular momentum? You get it from yeah. sunshine, sunshine, which pushes on the telescope and isn't totally balanced. So the combination of those two things means you have to use fuel. And that's the and thing that saves the lifetime of the observatory. Okay, that was a lot, but we can understand it. Check this out. Reaction wheels are amazing, and I did a whole video on them years ago that goes into depth, but it's basically a way of orienting or pointing the spacecraft without using a rocket, just like this. You should probably go back and watch that one, too. One way I like to think about reaction wheels is motocross. This video from way back shows it pretty well. So a motocross racer goes flying up into the air, and they're briefly kind of weightless, like a spacecraft, but riders are able to control whether the nose of the body goes up or down by braking or accelerating. If they accelerate the back wheel, the nose goes up because the reaction torque spins the bike in the opposite direction of the wheel. And if they want to pull the nose down, then they hit the brakes, and all the torque of slowing down the wheel is redirected into the bike and it tilts down. Basically, it's the same idea on a space telescope, but instead of attaching motorcycles to it to turn it in different ways, they have little electric flywheels that are always spinning, and if they accelerate them or decelerate them, the angular momentum is transferred to the telescope and they can spin and point the spacecraft very precisely in all sorts of directions using a combination of reaction wheels oriented in different directions. The other thing that's fascinating about the James Webb Space Telescope is we're trying to keep it oriented in a very specific direction, but we're getting all this pressure from the sun. It's called solar radiation pressure. Basically, as light and radiation from the sun hit the telescope, they actually apply pressure to it, not unlike a sail. It's a really small amount of pressure, like a thousandth of a gram on a square meter of spacecraft. But if you think about it, if you're in zero G in the vacuum of space, a small force can offset everything, and you have to account for that. It's a really big deal. So, so way back in the back of it, where you can't see it in this black section behind the mirror, here is a huge box for instrumentation. And the instruments include uh, cameras and spectrometers to cover the entire wavelength that we can see, which ranges from uh, 0.6 microns, which you can see with your eye, out to 28 microns wavelength, which you definitely cannot. So he says the spectrum ranges from 0.6 microns to 28 microns. That's a measure of the wavelength of the light they'll be able to detect. This means the telescope will just be able to see the red portion of visible light, but it will look deep into the infrared. Spectrum. Obviously, Obviously, there must be some huge, huge advantage to focusing so much on the infrared, infrared spectrum, spectrum, and he's about to talk about that in a little bit. So, we also so we have, have uh, spectrometers that spread out the star like into the rainbow, rainbow, rainbow uh, of colors, colors to, uh, to find out uh, all the uh, measures, uh, measures of what's going on inside the object. So, the so first thing you want to know is what's it made of. So then, so then you look at the, the, uh, the uh, what's called spectrum, spectrum lines. lines. Uh, so the spectrum, spectrum lines come from different chemical elements and molecules. And, molecules. and, and uh, just uh, as you see when you look at the fireworks on July 4th here, here uh, each uh, different each color comes from a particular chemical, chemical element or molecule. But it's different, it's different though because, because you actually have shifting, shifting right? right? So How do you know that you're detecting the correct elements if you're redshift? You actually have to detect a pattern. Uh, if you uh, only you see one line, one spectrum line, you cannot be 100% sure what it's making. What's making it? Uh, so, uh, so you really, really need to find two or more if you really want to be sure you're seeing what you think you're seeing. So, uh, then, then... So what he's saying here is he's talking about absorption light, spectroscopy. So if I do uh, atomic spectrum... So you see, if, um, if, if you are looking at a star, and the star has hydrogen inside it, then you will be able to see special QR code, right? Like a QR code. So you are collecting light from a galaxy. You have this light going for a prism or something that will behave like a prism. And, and then you see on top of these colors here, you see like a pattern, like a QR code, right? And by looking at this QR code, you know that there is hydrogen. But it will be true for any element 
of the periodic table. So that's how we know that this star has magnesium, this one has calcium, right? And uh, it was developed in the 19th century by the chemist, but then it was understood by the physicist, right? That explained why. So this is called spectroscopy. And using spectroscopy, we know what things in the universe are made of, right? You, you just have to look at those uh, absorption lines. Oh, it's like a QR code. And actually, that, so here you have iron, you have calcium, oxygen. And actually, that's how helium was first discovered. We didn't know about helium. And, and all of a sudden, we see this very weird uh, QR code looking at the sun. And that's how we discover helium, because inside the sun, you have helium. And uh, why, why is it called helium? Because helios, helios means sun. So that's why you can tell the composition of a galaxy or a star using spectroscopy. Now, this accounts for the fact that sometimes the objects coming toward us are going away from us or participating in the expansion of the universe as a whole, uh, which can uh, change the wavelength of rather substantially. Yeah, I think that's going away from us as the wavelength of light that we receive is increased. So the fractional increase is called the redshift. So, so it can go from, from zero or even minus, minus if the thing is coming from quote toward us to uh, large, large numbers. numbers. And so far, the farthest thing, thing we've seen with the telescope is uh, so red 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 11, 11, which means, which means the fractional, fractional, fractional shift is 11. 11. means the uh, wavelength that we get is 12, get is 12 times, times what it was when it started. Oh, so that's a multiplier that, multiplier that you're talking about. Oh, wow. So if you see, for instance, the Lyman alpha line at 0.12 microns wavelength, by the time we get it, it's at 1.44. So this is why infrared is so important, because everything is shifted that direction. So if you're studying the distant universe where the expansion has stretched out all the way, you definitely get it. So we talked about that, right? So if you want to see very, very far away galaxies, you are going back, 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 back in time, just after the Big Bang, like 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So all the light coming from those galaxies, very old galaxies, the first galaxies ever, um, all the light will be shifted to the infrared because light has been stretched out. They have to have an infrared telescope to study the light that started out as ultraviolet. So, so quick question. So if you've seen a shift of 11 times, does that mean that you have a sensor on board that will sense beyond 11 times? Yes. Okay. So our telescope, uh, it depends on what wavelengths you started with. Right, right. But if you started with that particular Lyman alpha line from hydrogen, um, at a redshift of 11 is 12 times the original wavelength, there's 1.44 microns. Got it, got it. So, uh, but, but... so I hope you you. Got that? So if you are looking at those lines here, right? If uh, you are looking at something moving like very, very far away and it's moving away from us, so it's going to be red shifted. So it doesn't mean that the galaxy look more red. It means that those lines here will be shifted to the red. And by finding the amount of shift, you, you can find, you know, um, how far it is. And that's how they found the universe is accelerating. Suppose the universe has got things no, even further away, away. Uh, so that so we that see we even see more expansion more since then time. time. Uh, we're set up to see, see uh, and uh, we think we might see, see objects that are rich after 20 or 30. Are you excited about that? They are predicted. We are fairly confident of some of those predictions. Okay, my camera kept overheating, but this is a good time to talk about redshift. You've experienced this in a way with a siren and a Doppler effect. As a ambulance or siren comes towards you, you experience a higher tone, but as it passes you and moves away, that tone gets lower. The sound waves from the siren are compressed against each other as it comes near you, so it appears to your ears as if it's a higher frequency, and the sound waves seem to be expanded as it moves away from you, and your ears perceive it as a lower frequency. The same thing happens with light. So as light from a star that is moving away from us reaches us, the way we see that light is an expanded version of that light. Like the tone from the siren drops, the frequency from the light appears to drop, and it moves from the visible spectrum down into the infrared spectrum. So if we didn't look into the infrared range, we couldn't see light that started out as visible light on things that are moving away from us. This is the red shift, and in a universe that's ever expanding, many of the objects we're looking at and looking for will be moving away from us. So looking in that lower infrared spectrum is super important. So this is a giant tripod, there's three legs. So the hinge points here, 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 and, the one, and this leg folds in half. 
and here's and the here's point. So, so uh, to get this ready for launch, launch we, we let pull this one out sideways. sideways. So you can pull the mirror up here, here, here and the legs and actually fold around behind high. the observatory. Wow. Well, well, so so this this is, you had a glimmer in your eye when you said that. That's kind of a that's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's one of many things that have to work when you launch. Of course, everything is folded up for launch. Everything has to unfold and do the right thing to come there. Of course, of course, the big question everyone has is, are you sure it's going to work? And the answer is, uh, of course, you can't be sure. Uh, but we are doing what we th should be doing to make sure. So uh, what do you do? Well, number one, you have two of everything where you possibly can. So you get two shots when you need them. Um, you uh, rehearse everything and practice and practice and practice. And practice, and practice. Uh, and you have and grouchy people come to tell you when you're not doing it right. It's really important, important, important because we hate doing it wrong, doing it wrong even if we don't like being told. What are those people, the quality, quality, quality assurance officers? There's a review panel. We get yeah, yeah, peer reviews, uh, we get senior, senior engineers that have done something related before and then have a good instinct about these things. They say, no, I don't like that. Do it some other way. Right, right. So, but the most important thing is you test and test and test and test because there's no such thing as analyzing anything well enough that you can be sure. You know, you have destructive test and non-destructive test. Tests. So how do you so perform a test when you only have one test article? Well, we actually made several test articles. So you can watch the rest because some people are spacing out. But it's a super interesting uh, video. And you see all the technology that was involved. So for example, to test the telescope, okay, what they made here, they have a vacuum chamber. So it's a special chamber. You remove all the air. So it's like in space. In space, you have no air. And, and you can test the telescope. A large vacuum, and they, they pump with the vacuum into it to, uh, uh, to make it cold. 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 Make it that's, a, this is what it takes. That's amazing. I love the look. Like it's like you know? uh, Yeah, it looks like a boiler. Like a boiler. <laughs> but backwards. It's made to keep pressure out. Take pressure. Take pressure. Take pressure. Take pressure. Take pressure. All designs on paper. You know, they all make things like that. It's all analog. Okay, so we're on the top floor now. We are. And then there's the and then there's the vibrations that will happen during the launch. Okay, this is the shaker table. So the Ariane is going to shake violently. What you have to do is you have to make sure that the telescope isn't going to break during launch. So here at Goddard Space Center, check it out. It's a really cool area here. This is the way they test that. They'll put the telescope here, they'll mount it in position, and then they'll shake it violently to make sure that nothing falls apart, nothing breaks. There's some B-roll footage of them doing that, the vibration testing. You can see the telescope shaking. Okay, I'm in a really neat spot right now. This is the tent that they move James Webb around with. It's like a portable plane room. And this is the sound chamber where they're gonna they're gonna acoustically load the thing. What they're doing here is simulating the roar of the rockets, which can get up over 140 decibels and so can be very destructive. So they've got this big chamber with speakers in it, with a massive subwoofer and other speakers to blast it with sound. That's a subwoofer up top. This is the largest subwoofer in the country, as far as I know. You really want to drop the bass where you start The cool thing about the sound chamber is that the sound is different at different parts in the chamber because you get reflections and echoes off the wall. For example, if I have a sound wave going across and bouncing off the wall, you might get constructive interference, meaning you get a louder sound at different points, and you might get a quieter spot. So, in order to test that... Okay, so you can... Uh, I'm not going to show the whole video, but... Uh, so you can see it's a very high-tech high, high tech telescope, and it's going around this very special orbit. I don't know if you can, can skip to this. The Lagrange point two orbit that we choose is actually the only place you can go where the uh, single-sided umbrella that we build can protect the observatory completely from all of those things at the same time. Lagrange points are special points in space where when you have two orbital bodies interacting with each other, there's these little special spots where things can kind of just balance. They're right in the sweet spot where they're being pulled in two different directions at the same time, and they just kind of hover there. Lagrange points are fascinating. There are five Lagrangian points for any combination of two orbital bodies. Since James Webb sensors could be affected by Earth's shine and moonshine, L2 of the Earth's sun system is the optimum place for it to be, and Dr. Mather is about to explain why. How are you going to communicate with it if it's on the other side of the moon? Uh, it's not. Uh, we don't go to that exact spot. Okay. And of course, the moon orbits as well. So, so are you orbiting the Lagrange point? If you orbit around the Lagrange point, you don't, you don't go to it. Um, number one, it's easier to get there. Number two, um, the Lagrange point's in the shade. Uh, it's actually right behind the Earth, and uh, most of the sunshine is being blocked by the Earth at that spot. So you want to go there. Can you, can you draw that for me on this piece of paper? Yeah, so, so sure, here is the, uh, here's this sun over here. 
Here's the Here's earth over here. here. And not to scale, scale, but here on the Orange Point. point. And we and are going, going, going to be orbiting around, around the Orange point, point like that. Just enough to get the sunshine around the Earth? Yeah. Where's the moon? The Earth. The moon is a lot closer to the moon. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video, but I highly recommend, I mean, if you're interested. So it's a very high technology. And as I've said, it's um, it was launched in 1996. No, launched in 19, no, launched in 2021, December. And, but it started to work on it in 1996. So you see how long it took, right? So you, you can read along, it's an amazing telescope. Okay, so here is another example of a space telescope. So this one is called TESS. And now we, are, we enter a new era when um, NASA doesn't launch its own um, spacecraft. It's, uh, it's using SpaceX as a third party, right? When they tried to use their own, it didn't end up well because Boeing messed up and those poor astronauts are stuck. Okay, I told you about the extra credit. I don't know why. Like SpaceX just uh, went there to the International Space Station. I'm not sure why they, they have to wait for February. I didn't check this out uh, to bring them back home. So anyway, uh, SpaceX, that's the one that is doing all the launching. And it was launched in uh, 2018, right? And what did it say? 62, 62. Oh, I forgot to show you. There is a website here. And if you are interested, you just click on it and it will tell you about that telescope here, right? So the link is here on that slide. So TESS, so the, the job, the job of TESS is to um, detect exoplanets and maybe, maybe life, right? Um, so they are still working on it and they are still uh, collecting data. So I have a short video about TESS, uh, TESS, 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 TESS. In the last, In the few, last decades, few decades, we have found, we have found thousands, thousands of worlds around, around other stars. Yes. A new A NASA, NASA astrophysics, astrophysics mission, mission will help us find, find many, many more. more. TESS, TESS the, transiting the Transiting Exoplanet, Exoplanet Survey Satellite, Satellite, is NASA's, is NASA's newest, newest exoplanet, exoplanet mission. mission. It's being it's led out of MIT, MIT and it's going, going to find thousands, thousands of new planets orbiting bright nearby, nearby stars. stars. And, it's, and going it's going to build upon the legacy of the Kepler mission, only it's going to focus on nearby bright stars that are sprinkled across the whole sky, and it's going to help us answer a really important question, and that is, which of our near stellar neighbors has planets? During its two-year two survey, survey, TESS will look for signs of planets, planets, planets ranging, ranging from Earth size to giants size larger, larger than Jupiter. Than Jupiter. TESS, TESS will search, search for these new worlds, or exoplanets, or exoplanets using new transits, transits, the same the method as the, as the Kepler, Kepler mission. mission. As a, as planet, a planet, planet passes, passes in front of its star, star it, blocks it blocks some of the light, light causing a slight drop in brightness. TESS can detect those subtle dips and even and use them, them to determine some basic, basic features, features of the planets, planets such, such as their, as their size, size and orbit. And orbit. Each of Each TESS's cameras, cameras has a 16.8 megapixel sensor, sensor covering a 24 degree square, square large, large enough to contain an entire constellation. constellation. TESS has TESS four, has of, four these of these cameras, cameras arranged, arranged to view a vertical strip of the sky, sky called an observation sector. The, the coverage of the test cameras, cameras is unprecedented in terms of the amount of sky that they can actually see at any given time and also their ability to cover such a broad portion of the sky. The types of targets that tests will allow us to find will enclose essentially all the bright nearby stars. TESS will watch each observation sector for about 27 days before rotating to the next one, covering first the south and then the north, to eventually build a map of 85% of the sky. This coverage, about 350 times what Kepler first observed, will make TESS the first exoplanet mission to survey almost the entire sky. TESS will fly in a highly elliptical orbit that maximizes the amount of sky the spacecraft can image and is carefully timed with the orbit of the moon. 
it will spend it most of each 13.7 day orbit collecting data. data. And then, and then as, it as it passes closer, closer to, Earth, to Earth, it will transmit that, that data to the ground. To the ground. Because, because TASA's observation, observation centers, centers overlap, overlap, it will have an area near the pole under constant, under constant observation. observation. This region, this region is, is easily is monitored, monitored by the James, James Webb Space, Space Telescope, Telescope, which allows, which allows the, two the two missions, missions to work to together, together to first, to first find, find, and then and carefully then study exoplanets. Since most of the exoplanets found by TESS will orbit bright stars, missions like Webb will be able to measure the spectra of starlight absorbed by the planet's atmosphere, which can indicate what they're made of. Ground-based measurements of the TESS exoplanets can determine their masses. Combining masses with TESS's size measurements reveals densities, allowing scientists to better understand the exoplanet's composition. The thing the that thing we're really excited, excited about with TESS, TESS is the way is the that way it'll actually build, build, on build on the momentum that we started with Kepler. Kepler. So TESS, so TESS is going to take that same search, search approach, approach but apply it to the vast majority of the sky, which still hasn't really been looked, been looked at in detail when searching for exoplanets. And by focusing, and focusing especially on planets, planets that orbit right nearby stars, TESS allows us to start looking at things like planet composition and atmospheric makeup. And that'll be crucial when we want to start looking around stars that are even further away in deeper parts of the galaxy as well. TESS is the vanguard of a new era of exoplanet study and will forever expand our understanding of worlds beyond our own. Okay, so that's a nice video. Okay, and lastly, I think the Event Horizon Telescope. So I already talked about it. It's like a worldwide or Earth-wide large telescope. And the way they do it, and already talked about this technology, they have dishes like the radio, radio telescope, all uh, communicating with each other. And with a technique which is called interferometry, everything happens, they have a huge telescope, which improve the resolution a lot. Because you remember, radio waves tend to diffract more. Because radio waves have such a large wavelength when it's going through an opening, like a radio telescope, okay, it's going to feel so much the opening that it won't to diffract. So, by the way, for the Poseidon diffraction, it's when a wave band over a corner, okay, this is called diffraction. So to resolve, I mean, to uh, to deal with that, we need to have a very, very, very large telescope, okay? And this is called the Event Horizon Telescope. See, if you pay attention, it's so easy. This class is so easy. You see the Earth here, you have several uh, telescopes, so it involves several observatories communicating with each other. Now it's easy to send, to transmit data, okay? We don't need wire anymore. And, um, and that's how we have an Earth-wide telescope. So you see all the Chile is involved here. And then um, you see all of Spain. They have one in Spain. So this is Spain, this is Canaries I talked about. And Hawaii, Hawaii is over there. And uh, Mexico, over here, and so forth, and so on. Even in the South Pole, you have one. So everything is connected to each other. Uh, yeah. So if you want, there is a link. So the event horizon is amazing because it took for the first time a picture of a black hole. And remember, that black hole, it was in the, when is it, 2019. Because it, it was launched in 2009, but it took 10 years. And they took a picture, the first picture of a black hole at the center of the galaxy M87. Remember M87? It's the galaxy uh, at the center of a group of galaxies called the Virgo Cluster. And the Virgo Cluster and our local group of galaxies part of the super, super Virgo Cluster, right? So anyway, they were able to take a picture of it, right? And that led to a Nobel Prize, okay? Trigger Nobel Prize. And the Nobel Prize happened in 2020, okay? So it was, 
it was not because of the picture, it because it was confirmed that black hole is not science fiction, it's it's a real a real thing. So that Nobel Prize um, was given to three three people. Uh, one, let's see if I Google here. So one one was uh, for what's his name? Roger Penrose. I think he's British. So okay. And uh, so what he said, he worked on Einstein equations. And what he said is very interesting. He said, uh, so he worked a lot on black hole with uh, Stephen Hawking. And you, you see a black hole, you have at the center, you have what is called singularity. So the singularity is it's the point, it's the point where the mass, the mass okay, of, of the star that collapsed, right? is so, 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 so large. Okay, and the density is infinite, that it will curve space time infinite, uh, like in an infinite, uh, like a vertical slope, right? In indefinitely uh, curved, right? And at that point inside the black hole, the laws of physics break, break down. And we really don't know what's happening because you have to combine quantum physics, physics of the very small, because it's very small, but at the same time, you have to work with general relativity. So we don't know what's happening in the black hole, but around the black hole, you have something called, it's like a frontier, it's called the event horizon. And everything is fine outside the event horizon, but um, if the event horizon is crossed, there, there is no escape uh, escaping the black hole. So when light okay, is unfortunate enough to cross that event horizon, it's it's gonna be falling inside the black hole and it cannot escape. So that's why it's black. So he came with the amazing idea. He explained that this event horizon, it's good for us because it's protecting us, the rest of the universe from those black holes. If those black holes you don't have a shield, okay, God knows what will happen to everything else in the universe, right? So it means we are shielded from the black hole, and the black hole is shielded from us. Okay, so it's like uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the Faraday cage. Okay, so if you are inside uh, inside the cage, for example, um, or you you go inside the tunnel. You cannot you cannot have signal from your phone, right? You cannot you cannot detect uh, your FM radio. You cannot get uh, you cannot use your phone, okay? Because a metallic uh, uh, cage is like called a Faraday cage, and it's going to be shielding it's shielding uh, from electromagnetic waves. So uh, you know sometimes uh, your cables here, if you cut them, you're gonna see like aluminium foil. This aluminium foil is like a shield, right? It's shielding from outside. So inside here, okay, the signal doesn't know about the outside world, and the outside world doesn't know about the inside. Okay, that's why you have these uh, people who want to wear those uh, tin foil on on their head. It's not that stupid. It's just to protect the brain from electromagnetic wave, right? It's shielding. Um, so event horizon, it's protecting us from the black hole. Okay, it's like a totally shielded world. So he got the Nobel Prize for that. And uh, two other people, and this, these other people you have, uh, I, I don't memorize the name. Uh, so you have one, which is Ren. Uh, how do you spell it? Um, okay, that's one astrophysicist. So he's the one, one, one of one of the two who use the infrared telescope to detect the supermassive black hole that we have at the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So it's one of them, right? And then you have another one. And, and the way he did that, he used infrared to see that the stars, okay, the stars, when they go around the black hole, they're going to move really fast, right? Because the tug from the black hole is very strong. So he studied, so you cannot see the black hole, okay?
okay? But you can see things spinning, orbiting the black hole, and it goes really fast because the mass is huge. So more, more mass means the when, when stars are orbiting this mass, they, they're going to spin uh, very quickly. And the other physicist, her, it's a her name, is Andrea here. So she used the Hawaii. Um, in Hawaii, you have the Keck telescope, and she used adaptive optics. So she was uh, one of the first ones to use adaptive optics at the Keck telescope. And same thing. She was observing the motion of stars around the black hole. So both, both of them, they detected the black hole. So black hole is not, it's not like science fiction anymore. Okay. And, and secondly, it was harder, but they were able to uh, take a picture of the black hole at the center of our uh, galaxy. Right? So about black hole, you see Einstein, Develop general relativity. And one, one of the solutions of his equations was black holes, but he didn't believe in it, right? He didn't say that, he didn't think that it was possible. Because then, then he, he said, I don't believe God play dice, meaning everything has to be explained. We, we should be able to predict everything, right? So we cannot, uh, he didn't believe in it. And then other scientists, like Charles Freud, he's the one who uh, computed the, the radius of the event horizon. You have also Chandra Seka, still the same one, who was able to compute that if a star is collapsing, and it's all computation, right? Using mathematics, he was able to, comp to, to compute that if a star is collapsing, a very, very massive star, and it's over, it gets to uh, over a certain mass, it will collapse as a black hole. Okay, Sandra Sekar, and then you have this scientist also, and Roger Penrose. So we, 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 we touch a domain which is very strange, right? And then, the, but, but very strange, but very true. So people say black hole is not a thing, but it is a thing. Now we have the picture of it, right? And, and we really don't know what's happening inside. So people think that you have a wormhole connecting to another part of the universe. Who knows, right? I know if I have time, but um, there is this cartoon. Uh, maybe I will um, I will save it for next time because you start gonna start to move on your chair. Uh, but but it's a it's a very nice episode from The Simpsons about black hole. So sometimes the cartoons are are very ahead. Of, of the movie, like uh, Space Odyssey, very ahead of their time. Or South Park, sometimes they come with uh, things that happen after, right? So we watch that next time. And I wanted to give extra credit for the people who come on time and not like 20 minutes before, but I will, I will do it next time, remind me.